If you would have asked me five years ago what the on-trend brewing thing would be in 2021, I would have guessed something with the letters I, P, and A. And I would have been wrong. Laugh all you want, but Hard Seltzer is here to stay. And Imperial Yeast's new seasonal strain W04 Paramount can help brewers get the most out of their water fermentations. A clean and aggressive fermenter, Paramount will produce an excellent seltzer with low fusel alcohols, plus it's gluten-free. If you've tried making seltzer with standard ale or lager strains, you know the struggle. And Imperial Yeast is here to help with W04 Paramount. Learn more about this novel strain at imperialyeast.com and pick up your W04 Paramount before it's too late. If your water is good enough to drink, it's good enough to brew with. It's likely nearly every brewer out there has heard this trope at one time or another. And if you're like me, it was used to justify ignoring the very ingredient that makes up the largest proportion of beer. Well, over the last few years, the general perspective about the impact water chemistry has on beer appears to have shifted a bit, something that seemingly corresponds with the development of a particular style. You're listening to the Brewlosophy Podcast. I'm your host, Marshall Schott. And joining me to discuss sulfate to chloride ratios, especially as it relates to hazy New England IPA, is contributor Andy Carter. Hey, Marshall. Yeah, well, water, the essence of life, really. <laughs> you know, we spend so much time drinking water because we have to drink it to survive. And then sometimes it's just kind of thrown by the wayside for brewing. So it's good to look at this, reevaluate it, and maybe remind everyone what's going on when you add minerals to your water. Absolutely. When the whole hazy IPA thing really started to blow up a few years ago, a bunch of us brewers were curious to figure out what exactly made it look and taste so different than other uh, normal types of IPA, I guess. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and we learned that in addition to different grain bills and hop schedules, many brewers of this style were taking a completely different approach to water chemistry. As someone who relies heavily heavily on sulfate to chloride ratios in my own brewing. I'm looking forward to chatting about this with you as, as well as the results of an experiment you performed on the topic. All right, if you like what we're up to and you want us to keep doing it, please consider becoming a patron of Brewlosophy by committing to a small monthly pledge over at patreon.com slash brewlosophy. You're going to receive rewards uh, like access to unpublished recipes, unique discounts at yakimavalleyhops.com, and an invitation to a monthly live Q&A session with somebody in the brewing world. Just last week, we had Lorena Evans from Homebrew Talk on. It was fantastic. And coming up next month are our friends from Imperial Yeast, uh, who are obviously masters of all things yeast, but also know a ton about brewing in general. Imperial Yeast recently expanded to the East Coast, and I believe they made some, some pretty cool changes to their original West Coast lab as well. So it's likely we're going to get a tour on top of them answering a ton of questions. It's going to be rad. Uh, to be a part of it, you have to make your pledge at patreon.com slash brewlosophy by February 26th, 2021. That's the day before the session. Uh, if you try to get in the day of the session, it's likely uh, we may overlook it because we're so busy doing everything else. So make sure you make that pledge before uh, the session, which would be February 26th. All past sessions are stored on our private Facebook page, so patrons can go back and watch them whenever they like. Really quick, I know you hear us talk about these things in every episode, the whole Patreon thing, and we only do it because it seriously does matter. In order for us to produce all of the content we do on this podcast, at the website, and now on the Brew Lab, we need financial support, and Patreon allows us to get that in a way where patrons are also rewarded. So it's a win-win for everybody. If you like having all of this content for free, toss in a few bucks a month, and I promise we'll keep producing it. Also, thanks so much to all of our current patrons. You are the reason we're still here. All right. If you wouldn't mind letting us know what you think about this show by leaving a rating and a review in Apple Podcasts or wherever it is you listen to podcasts, we'd really appreciate it. By doing so, those who haven't heard of us yet can more easily find the show. Feedback is brought to you by Brewers Hardware, who specialize in tri-clover compatible sanitary fittings, conical fermenters, kettles, and brew stands. Brewers Hardware offers a variety of unique items for home and craft brewers, including high-quality stainless fittings at great prices with super fast shipping. Learn more at brewershardware.com. And don't forget to mention Brewlosophy at checkout to receive a free gift. That's brewershardware.com. Listener Mitch Carlin from Australia wrote in with some feedback on a question we addressed in our latest Brew and A episode. He said, greetings from Australia. I have some feedback for the, uh, for the person who was considering using an ale yeast strain for his lagers to potentially provide a crisper or cleaner finish. I found in my brewing that monitoring the pH of the wort after the boil can be helpful as it gives me an indication of where the pH should finish 
finish after fermentation. For example, if my post-boil wort starts at 5.3 pH, I can expect the finished beer to land somewhere in the vicinity of 4.3 to 4.4 pH, give or take. As we know, different beers have different finishing pHs, which somewhere along the way contributes to the mouthfeel and finish of the beers. When brewing lagers, I tend to adjust the pH of the boiled wort with lactic acid to somewhere around 5.1 pH, uh, if it's not close enough already. My own dork-like data collection has shown me this results in the beer finishing around 3.9 to 4.1 pH, uh, which helps to provide that dry, crisp, clean finish we know and love. This is by no means a golden rule or easy hack. Many other things come into play like acidity levels, grain bill, water profile, and it's probably just easier to aim for a lower pH earlier in the equation, but it could be room for exploration if the brewer feels a bit adventurous and has already tried other methods. Now, if I recall correctly, the person Mitch is referring to from that Brew and A episode was actually asking about using ale yeast to make passable lagers, but still, mm-hmm. I think the feedback's pretty interesting. No, I think this is spot on. Um, you know, when you get into it, when you really get into the nitty gritty, and I, I love the data collection part of his uh, answer. It's, <laughs> it's amazing. Um, you know, it's it's important to look at all the variables. And, you know, we're talking about water today, but, you know, especially when you're looking to finish the dial in that mouthfeel stuff. I mean, water chemistry is definitely a place to look. You know, I think there's some debate. I, I don't think it's clear cut, you know, saying definitely lower the pH or raise the pH because then there's a lot of other factors when you, when you do that. But it's definitely something to look at and try it yourself. You know, if you like when it's finishing at 4.1 or do you like when it's finishing at 4.3? I, I, I think that that's something you got to check for yourself and, and then change the process. You know, you can, it, it sounds, um, you know, not uh, kosher to add a- lactic acid in the keg, but you know what you can do it. You can always add the minerals later. You can always add those things later on. You don't have to do it in the boil. So yeah, I mean, give it a shot, see what happens. Yeah. I used to get really hung up on mash pH uh, until a yeah. couple of experiments showed that it doesn't seem to have a, a very big perceptible impact on flavor. Uh, so I don't focus too much on it on, uh, these days, but the idea of adjusting the pH of the boiled wort is really, really interesting to me. Obviously, the pH of the finished beer does matter. If you if you were to reduce the pH enough, you've got a sour beer. I mean, that's just the way it exactly. works. Exactly, exactly. And that element of acid, that that touch of acidity, is why we cook with acidic foods. It's you know mm-hmm. you want that crisp, bright flavor. So it makes sense to me that that uh, you know ensuring that a, a lager beer finishes with a slightly lower pH than you know a blonde ale or something, mm-hmm. uh, in order to to get that crisp that crisp character that you're after, it makes sense that that would work. So I, I really do appreciate the feedback, Mitch. Really, really interesting idea. If you have show feedback, you can send it to feedback at brewlosophy.com or drop us a note on social media. Well, friend of Brewlosophy, Mark Pellicle, brews up some very interesting concoctions, often using honey and other curious sources of fermentable sugar. However, he also makes beer. <laughs> a recent one being a Russian imperial stout, he calls, I believe I'm saying this right, Sika Rex, about which he says... While it's American-made, it contains high levels of Russian collusion that will leave you with memories of glorious motherland and glasnost on the exhale. Best paired with the gulag. One minute beer review with Jersey and Tim. What, are we drinking coffee, you know? Yeah. This is yeah. as stout as it gets. I love it when we see dark beers like this because I'm like, it's going to be only one of like two things. Like our chances of successfully knowing what it is go up significantly. Look at the head on that. Who said it? It starts out dark. It's like a perfect dithering of, of the colors. This beer looks incredible. I love it already. And here's why. Because it's light flavor. For as dark as it looks, it's light. Oh, I like that. It's out of balance in my mind. There's a lot going on that's not balanced out. Conflicting of flavors. This is like metallic T- to me. metallic cool. I get like a lot of different flavors that aren't in balance. Like everything's happening but not together. Dude, yeah. this beer's not together. It doesn't want to, it, does, it doesn't want to exist. It's trying, but it just hasn't happened yet. This beer is confusion to me. We should name it Confusion Beer. I would name it Confusion Beer. It's a new style. It's not for me. It's not no, for see, me. Remember we said we say it's not for me. That means it's not bad. It just... We don't know. like it. No, then there's a bad aftertaste here. There's like a... That's a metallic taste, I'm telling you. You call it metallic dude. I, but I don't know what to call it, but it, it just, it hits hard. It, it draws attention to the confusion of the beer. It's just confusing. There's a lot of things going on they aren't working together dude they're not working together they need to get together and have a board meeting and fix themselves yeah and that aftertaste there's an aftertaste there. a little roast but very little you know we're just ham and eggers here i mean i'm sure this is a very good beer and we're idiots so we just you know that caveat negative five for me negative six for me for a total of three confusion is right i mean jersey started off saying he liked the beer and then he ended up saying he's not a fan because it's out of balance it sounds the like the beer maybe wasn't the only thing out of balance <laughs> <laughs> it's a it, i don't think 
think I've ever heard of a Russian Imperial Stout being called light. Uh, so I don't know what it was tasting like, but um, but it sounded great. I, I don't know. Did you think it tasted light on the finish? Maybe the honey was a, was factoring there? I don't think he used honey in this beer, actually. Okay. I think it was a pretty classic Russian Imperial Stout, at least okay. based off of what... All, all he told me was what I just read. Uh, Got it. But, but it didn't have a real, uh, like a honey flavor or anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm not a huge fan of huge beers in general, but, but I did think this beer was pretty... I thought it tasted pretty good. Oddly enough, I get what the guys were saying about it having kind of a lightness to it. It was it was kind of thin bodied, which maybe he did use honey in it, and that's what that's how it got that way. But you know, you drink a Russian Imperial Stout, and it's usually kind of thick, uh, kind of viscous in your mouth. This yeah. was not that. It was it, mm. it was almost as if it wasn't you know ten ish percent ABV beer. It was like a a normal. Uh, it was it was an interesting experience. So I get what the guys are saying there, but I thought it tasted good. I don't quite understand the out of balance unless what Jersey was referring to is the is that mouthfeel component. Sure. Uh, thanks again, Mark, for sending everything in that you did. We've still got plenty to get to. If you'd like to have your beer or any other fermented beverage you feel like sending in reviewed by Jersey and Tim, you can email me, Marshall at brewlosophy.com, and I'll get you all set up. When we're back from this break, the focus will be on sulfate to chloride ratios in hazy New England IPA. After a long brew day, the last thing I want to do is waste more time chilling wort. I've tried so many different options, and ultimately I settled on the super efficient immersion chillers made by Jaded Brewing. With the King Cobra and Hydra, I'm able to chill my entire batch of wort from boiling to just a few degrees above groundwater temperature in as little as six minutes. If an immersion chiller is right for your brewery, then do yourself a favor and check out all of the rad options Jaded Brewing has to offer at jadedbrewing.com. And be sure to let them know Brewlosophy sent you. Compact and simple to use with a small footprint for brewing indoors, the Grainfather makes it easy for you to brew professional quality beers at home. The Grainfather is an all-in-one brewing system that lets you brew all-grain beer in a single, compact stainless steel unit. It uses an electric heating element and pump to maintain a constant temperature and to circulate the wort during the mashing and cooling stages. It also comes with a counterflow chiller to reduce chilling times and produce high-quality wort. And now, with the addition of their conical fermenter, the Grainfather takes things one step further by offering homebrewers state-of-the-art temperature-controlled fermentation just like commercial breweries use. And with the Grainfather Recipe Creator and Connect app, you can easily design a recipe, sync your brewing system with your phone, and then just sit back and relax as the app takes over and assures that you maintain your scheduled mash temps and boil schedule. Head to grainfather.com to purchase your all-in-one brewing system today and to sign up for their free recipe creator tool. Once more, head on over to grainfather.com, that's grainfather.com, and get started today. Family-owned Atlantic Brew Supplies, the largest homebrew shop in the Southeast. No gimmicks, no multinational corporate overlords, and no BS. They offer exclusive malts, yeast, and more from local artisans, as well as award-winning recipe kits. They also sell professional brewing gear and cask equipment from sister companies ABS Commercial and Cask Supply. Most ingredients are available by the ounce, plus Atlantic Brew Supply has an on-site calculator to help you craft your best brew. Orders are processed same day, and two-day shipping is guaranteed for East Coast customers. Get 15% off your first order using promo code BrewPod. That's B R U P O D at AtlanticBrewSupply.com. Up until about five years ago, I pretty much ignored water chemistry and was fine using anything that didn't smell like a swimming pool. Uh, And this was validated by my many good batches of beer that I brewed. Around the time hazy versions of IPA were growing in popularity, I got into a friendly argument with a buddy of mine who ultimately challenged me to do a water chemistry experiment that ended up coming back with significant results. Now I'm a hands-down hardcore believer in the importance of water chemistry for as as a tool for adjusting uh, the ultimate character of beer let's start by going over what exactly it is we mean by water chemistry yeah yeah so when you make your recipe you know you're talking about water malt hops yeast the biggest component of that by far is the water uh water you know 
you know, it's H2O, so that's what water is by itself. But you almost never find water by itself like that in nature. Uh, water is constantly having things dissolve into it, mm-hmm. uh, evaporate out of it, um, and so you you rarely find it just by itself. And so what is in water, uh, commonly found in water, are minerals like calcium, chlorine, uh, s- uh, sodium, and such stuff like that. And all those things together play a role in brewing anywhere from direct flavor impact to yeast nutrient health to uh, mash quality and things like that so today we're going to go through all those and break those down and what are important and then get to that really what this this talk is about which is what we mean by sulfite to chloride ratio yeah so so water the the when you think of minerals a lot of people say salts you know water salts yeah. and that's i think that's kind of an old school term it makes sense mm-hmm. you know i guess yeah. minerals are salts well, but- yeah. water yeah water minerals or salts come in two things a compound a cation and an anion right and we always come together in pairs when we add them they exist you know dissolved in the water separately in ratios but when we want to add them salts is a common phrasing we you know table salt is the colloquial term for sodium chloride right. but th- the salt is the the compound yeah and the, the the whole table salt thing is the reason i moved away from calling them brewing salts is because i don't want yeah. people to get mixed up and just go throwing i mean which you can use table salt in brewing a lot of yeah, people yeah. do it's it, it's very effective um but i w- what i was going to say just speaking of water on its own i was in new zealand a few years ago i had the a pleasure of visiting that gorgeous country and Mm. in wellington there is a like a spring that people go to and they they get fill up their bottles of water and it's just constantly flowing in the like city center it's really cool well well, what's so amazing about that water and what the what the locals will tell you is just how good it tastes why Mm. does water taste so good compared to other water if it's just water right to me that was one of the biggest aha dumb aha moments that i had was of course water chemistry matters you know you look at pellegrini or pellegrino whatever that water is that it actually lists the mineral profile on the side of that water there because they they are proud of what they you know that of that water uh, the, the way it tastes uh, because of that mineral profile. Of course, it's going to impact uh, the flavor of beer when when it makes up upwards of ninety five percent of of a re- of a beer's recipe. Yeah, so those like that's sort of super cool about mineral water. You know, you have these places like I always remember growing up in Michigan. You had the same kind of spring that would come up and have that water. And but if you look at the numbers on those things, I mean, we're talking you know many hundreds of parts per million of content. Yeah. Um, and so it's 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 interesting to think of like I'm going to brew with this water because it's got this story into it. But um, but just definitely look at that <laughs> look at that sheet before you start throwing it in your brew, brew schedule because that can have some serious downstream impacts on your beer. Yeah. Well, one of, and one of the things I think is kind of neat is you can you can start with your home water and you know the whole adage uh you know if it tastes good enough to drink you can brew with it it's true i mean i like i said i've i've brewed plenty of batches of of beer that were that came out really well won awards all that without even Mm -hmm. worrying about my water and what's neat about that is you can tweak your recipes maybe without even really knowing it but you can tweak them to fit the water that you have at your house i had a buddy when i was up in bellingham who would brew wherever he lived was getting completely different water than i was but he would brew pretty much just dark beers and the and his reason at the time was i just make them better i'm just better at brewing these beers well come to find out his water was really hard uh and so yep. those, that just happened to work really well with the darker styles of beers that he was brewing um and you know and yeah. there are we're, we're going to get break down the the main brewing uh minerals here in a sec but there are certain uh water profiles that are believed at least to do better in certain styles of beer such as hazy ipa and i think that's why uh people have started using Using these, I would contend, kind of unique for the style profiles. Uh, so let's let's break down a bit the the main the five main uh, brewing min- or minerals in water that that are important in brewing. I think the first one is calcium. Yeah, calcium. So calcium can be added a couple different ways. I think the most common one is in a is a gypsum calcium sulfate. Um, you know, calcium is it's just interesting. You know, you get it because it comes along the ride for the other mi- uh, mineral you want, uh, but it helps. You know, it's not necessarily something you're going to taste. Again, we're going to talk in these kind of generalities today because it's all kind of personal preference when you how you balance these things or it's style specific. But when we're adding these, you know, it's somewhere between zero and 500 parts per million. You can exceed that, but tends to be not do not exceed 500 parts per million. Mm-hmm. But in the case of calcium, you're not really getting anything below 200 and it's helping the beer clarify and it's helping yeast health. And I definitely have seen this in my evolution of my brewing. 
once I got my calcium better, my beers were clearing up a lot faster. Yeah. It seems yeah. a little bit kind of subtle, but it definitely matters. So when you're adding calcium, you want that ratio to be high enough to help the yeast and everything, but it's not something you're going to necessarily miss straight up. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's one of those things. I remember, um, there used to be a, a kind of a, a common recommendation of, of make sure that your calcium levels are, are no lower than 50 PPM. Yeah. Um, and, and then I've heard people say they, they prefer no lower than hundred PPM. Both of those are, you're well within safety range there. I mean, you're not, oh, you're yeah. not going to get a chalky flavor or anything from that. I've noticed the same thing. And to me, it's almost counterintuitive because calcium, you think of calcium, you think of a white powdery substance that mm-hmm. would, you know, ostensibly make something look murkier but it does it really it's a, it, it helps with yeast flocculation uh, yep. it helps to beers tend to clarify faster uh, when your calcium levels are in the right range and like you said it is contributed uh, by numerous other compounds that we use uh, in brewing um, real quick I, I want to do a quick delineation because we're going to talk about sulfate here in a second yeah uh, it, it, it is so commonly misspoken as sulfite and and those are different sulfates and sulfites are different they're both sulfur based compounds so they're they, they, it makes sen- it makes sense. Sulfites, uh, which usually comes in the compounded form of you know potassium or sodium metabisulfite, yeah. are used as a preservative. <laughs> so yes. you add those to, for example, wine or to cider uh, to knock the yeast out. It basically shuts the yeast off from metabolizing sugars. If you hear us misspeak, it's just because there's it's one letter difference, and we're just not you know we're talking too fast. So I, I wanted to get that clear that up and get that out of the way. I know Malcolm and I got into a conversation about it a few years ago on the show. <laughs> we uh, we have the same one in my field, uh, electrical engineering, uh, you know, computer chips are made out of silicon, not silicone. (laughs) And it's very common for people to say silicone. And I've actually seen very famous people give talks and accidentally say silicone, not silicon. So, you know, it's okay. We, we, we understand. Silicone is for baking stuff in, right? Or like exactly yeah, yeah. correct. It's a, it's a, (laughs) it's a plastic. It's a, it's an organic plastic. Silicon is an inorganic molecule, uh, you know, element. Yeah. Yeah. So the next compound, and, and this is one, this is actually a mineral uh, uh, that, that I feel like doesn't get much focus in brewing these days, but I'm starting mm. to see the see it talked about a little bit more as magnesium, yes. commonly contributed to beer in the form of magnesium sulfate, which is also known as Epsom salt. Correct. So yeah, so again, magnesium, it's in these low levels, and I, I know sometimes we anthropomorphize yeast as it needs its balanced diet of, of micronutrients, much like humans need, you know, trace minerals. That's and, you know, right. If you, you know, you, you, you can take your vitamins and stuff, but generally, if you eat a balanced diet, you're going to get all these minerals. And again, it's riding, it's along for the ride for other stuff. I always add it. Though, I think there's two interesting cases I've heard of um, c- cropping up these days, how the other I- impacts. Uh, a professional brewer doing brew pub stuff told me he was adding a little too much magnesium to his beers, and these were having a laxative effect uh-huh. uh, to uh, some people. So watch <laughs> out. Don't, do, again, do not exceed if you, you know, it, you know, it, it lists on the Epsom salt, I believe, as a as a laxative. So you know, watch out. Uh, <laughs> second thing is, and people are doing more. I think I think getting a little deeper, and it's actually going to impact our discussion of hazy IPAs a little bit. Yeah, is hazy IPAs tend to age more rapidly. They they take on color more rapidly, and um, they can just look bad if they're not packaged well. You know, we we at Brewlosophy really focus on that downstream cold side packaging mm-hmm. stuff because of that impact. Uh, but there's actually another thing is that these mi- these minerals like magnesium or or, or metals can actually impact that increasing that that aging process. Um, there's looking into the the uh, grains themselves have too much of these uh, compounds in them that can create that color. So I don't know if magnesium has been traced back yet to adding to the color changing of it, but it's something to think about. Uh, in general, again, this is a long for the ride type of thing. Don't add tons of it, uh, but you know, a little bit will help out. Yeah, well, and uh, again, uh, magnesium sulfate. So by using, if by adding a, a touch of Epsom salt, you, you are going to increase your sulfate levels. Uh, which which is known to or widely believed at the very least to emphasize hop bitterness and hop flavor. It kind of mm-hmm. provide that poppy, crisp hop character. Again, like you, the last thing most brewers and beer drinkers I know need is help with their bowels. Do yes. not overuse Epsom salt. You, it, it is a laxative. Just just trust us on that one. I've made the mistake. <laughs> you don't want to do that. Uh, we already mentioned it earlier. Another another common one is sodium. Uh, that is a mineral that that people People use in their beer sodium obviously you add a sprinkling of table salt on your steak and it makes it taste way better it can do the same for beer in fact we've got experiments on that as well the most
most common source of sodium that I'm aware of in brewing, uh, sodium being Na, you know, the the that's the periodic element, uh, is table salt, which is which is uh, uh, sodium chloride. And when you use something like table salt, you're also adding a little bit of chloride. Yeah, yeah. So in general, sodium is always going to be in the background, even when you do these filter filtering mediums. You know, one of the ways of doing salt water softening is to exchange the minerals for sodium. So you right. know, some people that have water softeners at home, they're going to add a lot of sodium. So you want to watch out there. Um, you know, it's it was reading the books. You know, there's a great resource. It's kind of always on my bookshelf. The Colin Kaminsky, John Palmer Water Book. It's got all these descriptions and things. And you know, their recommendation or they, their numbers were saying, you know, don't exceed 150 ppm until you get a salty taste. Now, Goza's, Berliner Weiss, you know, these beers that have salt in them. Uh, you know, they that has that salty taste is how you're getting that that salt taste, right? Uh, so don't go too too overboard. But it, it does say in general, you know, a fuller, sweeter profile to the beer if it's done in a, you know slightly delicate, yeah, way. properly, and and using a a deft touch with sodium. Yes. Um, again, this is I think sodium. There's a lot of room for exploration with adding table mm-hmm. salt to beer. Another way that you can contribute sodium is through the use of sodium bicarbonate, which is just baking yes. soda, um, and that's and that would be NaHCO3, of course. Uh, baking soda again will contribute noticeable levels of sodium if you use enough. The thing about baking soda is it doesn't really dissolve very well, uh, so you yeah. just want to you want to make sure if you're if you're if you're looking to use to up your bicarbonate levels, you might want to find another source for that. And then we've got uh, sulfate and chloride, the two uh, I probably most commonly discussed brewing uh, minerals, brewing salts. Uh, sulfate is is the most absolutely the most common way to get sulfate into beers through the use of gypsum, which is calcium sulfate. Mm-hmm. Again, that's a compound that's also going to increase your calcium levels. Uh, and mm-hmm. if you look, you know, you think about sulfate levels in general, you can get those through gypsum or through Epsom salt. I, I think most people are probably getting them through gypsum. Oh, yeah, yeah. So this is a, I mean, it's got to be the one, I think the first or second beer kit I ever got at included a little packet of gypsum, like add this. Yep. So it's like, of course. So it's a, you know, people call it Burtonizing your water. And that's comes from the fact that Burton on Trent, you know, the, the, the story, the fabled story of how IPAs were made, you know, this has got water that has a very high sulfate content uh, in general. Yes. It, you hit, hit it on the head, Marshall. You know, this is a way of adding sulfate to up your bitterness to make the hops pop is what the common f- phrasing is. Yeah. Um, and you can add any range, you know, you can start with very little, go very high. You know, I think this is the one where you can see published results saying five, six, seven hundred ppm, which is like an insane amount of gypsum <laughs> to add to a beer. Uh, but you know, that's where these styles come from. And that's gonna refine the bitterness. Um, you know, it's for me, my brewing experience, you know, overall, you know, I watch my water content and I add kind of a base coat of, of minerals. I don't want to go in one direction or the other unless I know I have to. Yeah. Uh, but for me, you know, this is definitely something that's gonna contribute to the flavor, contribute to the final bitterness. Um, and it's something you know, this and chloride are the two places to really dial in a recipe when you're trying to make it your beer. Yeah, there there are a lot of approaches to uh, adjusting your water chemistry. And, uh, you know, a lot of them will. There, there are people who like to match, for example, a regional profile. I, I'm not a big fan of that. I feel like mm-hmm. there's, I, you know, a lot of the, the regions that have beers that they're known for, whether that's, you know, Czech Pilsner or, you know, Irish Stout. Those regions just happen to have that water and it just so happens happen to work for that style of beer that they're making mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. you have the ability as a brewer to to make whatever water you want nowadays with our modern yep. understanding of how this stuff works uh, so so sulfate is like you said Andy is the is the one of the most commonly used uh, minerals or discussed minerals and by adding gypsum you are ex- you're you're what is believed to happen and I think a lot of us have experienced this is it adds this element of crispness it, it pumps up that brightness of the hop character you get that added calcium so you're contributing to the yeast nutrient you're contributing to the potential clarity of uh, of the future beer the other mineral that it gets a a lot of focus is chloride and I, I don't think it's fair to, to view sulfate and chloride necessarily as opposites, but in many ways, they do kind of opposite things. Yeah, yeah. So the common uh, b- uh, belief phrasing, you know, uh, experience is that chloride is adding a fullness or a sweetness. So it's a, it's a clear delineation. And I think it's fair to talk about them as opposites, but of the same coin. They're they're going in different directions. They're doing different things, but they're all kind of generally enhancing flavor. Yeah. Uh, like we mentioned earlier about acid in food you know if you're making a tomato sauce and it's kind of a little plain squeeze a lemon boom 
flavors are popping. Right. So this is how we're, we're playing the game. So chloride is contributing to a fullness or a sweetness. In general, you don't add it nearly at the, the you don't see the rates nearly as high. Just I think this is just from the fact that it doesn't dissolve qu quite as well as uh, sulfate does into waters and stuff. But you're seeing, you know, anywhere from 50 to 200 parts per million. Um, you can exceed that, of course, but I think that's eventually going to throw off other things. And again, when we add these things, they're always added as a salt. Yeah. So when adding chloride is calcium chloride. You know, if you're adding a lot of calcium sulfate, a lot of calcium chloride, well, your calcium is going to go through the roof. So be careful there is that's going to could contribute to negative effects to the beer. Yeah, that it, that's an interesting comment because you, you mentioned earlier about how uh, you've seen sulfate levels in, you know, certain beer profiles that are off the charts. I mean, they're just yeah. way up there. I've seen that, too. In fact, I was having a, a chat. I believe it was with the late uh, tasty, you know, Mike McDowell, mm -hmm. who is saying that he prefers a uh, his sulfate levels for Janet's brown ale somewhere up in the 300 ppm range. Yeah. I don't think you're going to find chloride levels that high in, no in any yeah. style of beer. If no uh, I'm a big fan, and I, I know other brewlosophy folks are as well, of kind of tasting things along the way, uh, sure. you know, before you use it, just to kind of get an idea of what it might contribute to beer. If you've ever just had uh, gypsum powder on your hands and you lick it, it's just chalky. It doesn't taste like anything. Sure. If you take one of the tiny little calcium chloride balls and put it in your mouth, it's like a salt bomb. I mean, it is mm. massively salty. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. so they are obvious different things again though like you mentioned both are going to contribute that calcium which is a good thing uh that you want calcium levels in your beer to be relative not high but that 50 to 100 ppm range is pretty money and that's yep. pretty easy to accomplish using both sulfate or gypsum and calcium chloride i wish calcium chloride had a fun name like gypsum or, or epsom yeah, yeah, yeah well it has no history it has no historical uh, significance i think is the is the problem i'm sure we can find the name i'm sure it's, <laughs> yeah. it's some use somewhere and to know we're talking about these things and we're throwing these numbers around i think uh, i can speak for Marshall, but Marshall could also speak for himself, but I think we're going to say the same thing. The best way to calculate this stuff is Brewing Water by Martin Brewing. Oh, it's so good. Uh, yeah. Hands down, you know, Beersmith also has the same stuff, which is great, and if you're in the Beersmith universe, then go into Beersmith and do your water there, but the uh, pound for pound... Uh, his spreadsheet, it's doing automatic calculations. It has all these things in here. It tells you when to add it. It tells you what these things are going to do. It'll warn you if it's too much. Mm -hmm. I mean, just get that sheet and then throw them a couple bucks. So you get the uh, enhanced spreadsheet too. But that way, all these numbers are going to get dialed in for you. You don't have to guess anything. It's right there and you can save copies of it. It's just fantastic. I agreed with you 100%. And you knew I was going to say that. So, <laughs> 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 All right. So we've talked about these five main brewing minerals. Of course, there are hundreds of other minerals that, that get involved. You don't want to be brewing if you have too high chloride levels or, or chlorine levels or anything like that in your water. Yeah, yeah. We all understand that. One of the most common ways, and I will admit, it's the it's it's most it's mostly the way that I approach uh, brewing water nowadays myself is to look at the ratio of sulfate to chloride. We talked about, you know, not really viewing the two as being opposites, but there is this idea that the ratio of your sulfate to chloride in the water that you're starting with has an impact. Now, there's an, also an argument that says that that ratio is, um, how should I say this? That, that the ratio is what matters, not the overall amounts of the minerals. So I was trying to find where this started because I, I can't, I had a memory of trying to put all the pieces together and I, I thought this was started by a certain person. I can't find an origin story. Yeah. I do have a good, there is a good description, a good breakdown of this in the water book. I, but I remember bloggers talking about this, you know, a decade ago. So it's, it, you know, I'm not sure. But in general, the ratio is is some balancing act between going towards the more bitter, the more crispy, or the more soft, fuller, sweeter. Right. And so those are kind of the, the dial. But, you know, let's be clear. The ratio, if you had 5 ppm and 1 ppm, well, those are so low, you're not going to taste them. So, you know, ratios by themselves are not great. You need to talk about ratios and then total content. You know, so if we're wanting to get somewhere in the, you know, 50 to 150 ppm range, when you add them together, you should get around 300 ppm total. So, you know, you got to start there and then think about what you're doing. So the total amount matters and the ratio matters. Well, there, there are those, though, Andy, out there who would argue, who have argued that the ratio is really all that matters. Now, obviously, there's kind of this happy middle area. And we're sure. talking like, OK, if you, if you want a ratio, for example, a standard West Coast or what I call normal IPA, American yeah. IPA, clear IPA, it was pretty common uh, to go higher sulfate levels, yep. relatively low uh, you know, chloride levels to the mm -hmm. point of the ratio being being somewhere in the, you know, five, five to one range. So you'd have five yeah, yeah. parts of, of sulfate for every one part of chloride. Well, that ends up looking, if, 
if you if you go with what Tasty was doing, a three hundred you know ppm of sulfate, one fifth of that would be the, your chloride levels, or even lower. I mean, I, I brewed so many batches of clear IPA that I didn't add any chloride to whatsoever. Mm-hmm. I was just adding calcium sulfate gypsum to up my calcium levels and to get that really bright hop character. So it was sure. just sulfate, and then whatever chloride happened to be in my brewing water, which is you know my my tap water at home, which is really really low. I mean, we're t- the the ratio is probably you know 150 to 1 you know yeah so i mean it's it, again we're i think that's the the point of these dials is not it's not required to have these minerals there's going to be always a trace of them yeah uh but but you know to 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 tweak the knobs a bit to dial the beer and you're going to make the beer regardless it's going to come out and it's probably tastes very good these are these final touch points that we want to want to bring into to maybe edit the beer a little bit and alter it a little bit to make it how you want to taste it yeah so and this is uh this is where we can talk about hazy ipa now because yeah. when this style which is a trend bucking style that became the the trend setting style mm-hmm. uh it, you know you see all these hazy beers they're known for tasting juicy uh having a softer pillowy mouthfeel as people like to say what causes this well you know everyone's poking around it must be the use of you know flaked adjunct grains it must mm-hmm. be uh, the way the hopping this, you know the approach to dry hopping these beers or late hopping them in the kettle all of this stuff well one of the things people started to notice was that the water profile a lot of the more successful hazy ipa brewers were using favored chloride over sulfate which is again that's the exact opposite of what we're doing out here on the west coast to make our clear crisp ipa they mm-hmm. were they were using a water profile that looked almost more like something you'd find in a british ale yeah yeah so the interesting there thing there is if you look at that style and i think what you have to go back because of all styles it's like it's a it's a kind of a market reaction it's consumer demand in those beers the fundamental concept of a new england hazy juicy is that it's not as bitter no nowhere nearly as bitter and it's focused on the expressive hop flavor you know the big hop punch and then if you're trying to you know, paint that picture. If I'm looking at all my little, where, where, what knobs I can turn. Okay. Well, they got the flaked oats. Okay. I got very late hop additions, almost no bittering addition. Okay. Good. Low BU. And then it's like, well, the water, let's look at the water, the chloride. Well, we just described it softer, fuller, sweeter. Okay. This are all the things we want to do to drive that flavor. Okay. Let's do that and see where we end up. And yeah, so this drove people to maybe not to ignore the sulfate, but change the ratio to provide the experience desired. Yeah. Yeah, I um I was talking with some folks years ago who were who were exper- you know, home brewers who were experimenting with this this kind of newfangled style at the time and they were they were messing around with with ratios that were in the one to five range as opposed to five to Mm -hmm. one, right? So one part sulfate to every five parts chloride with that chloride getting up into the 150 ppm or so range. Um, Again, you've got that great calcium content by adding calcium chloride. You have a very low sulfate. Uh, Most of the New England IPA brewers that I'm aware of these days, uh, at least the ones that I've talked to, I do believe add a touch of, you know, uh, gypsum as well. So they, sure. they are, they're more into the balance thing as opposed to us crazy West coasters who just wanted crisp, bright, you know, poppy, yeah, yeah, bitter yeah. beer. Uh, but yeah, you think about what chloride is, has, has historically been used for in brewing and it's to uh, provide that rounded malt character, that soft mm-hmm. pillowy mouth feel. Uh, th- that is exactly what hazy IPA brewers are after. And so it makes sense that they would experiment with that. And, and it just so happens it would seem at least to have an impact on the character of that beer. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think there's, there's a lot of re- things that, you know, we've been talking about hazy IPAs forever. Uh, you yeah, know, they're, they're here and they have, you know, there's been different iterations of them. I, I, I do find them to have a bit of bitterness just because the, the hop load is so high. Yeah. Um, there's no way to avoid that. Um, but you know, it's it, the one when they're done well, when they're done correctly. I think they're they're just as good as a great West Coast IPA, mm-hmm. and and I have to attribute some of that to the water chemistry choices. Yeah, I uh, it, it, for for anyone who who's wondering what uh, uh, the difference really is between a, a, like a high sulfate and a high chloride beer, make a make like a just a mild, a British mild, and and mm-hmm. go a little bit overboard on your on your chloride. The experience that I get is like what I've <laughs> what I've told people, and I don't think most get it, is like a warming in my mouth. Not not, not like hmm. alcohol warming. It's like this, um, it, it's like a weird wash. It, 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 w- this warmth washes over my palate and kind of sticks around. And it's, it's a really odd experience. I've not been a huge fan of it in general. And so it makes sense mm-hmm. that, that, you know, uh, uh, 
hazy IPA isn't something that I'm necessarily clamoring after. And a part of it, I think, is because the experience I have when drinking it isn't that crisp, bright, sharp, you know, clean character. It's that it's that ju- like when you drink a glass of juice and it sticks in your mouth. Sure. I don't drink much juice for that reason, you know. So I do I do have to wonder if chloride isn't contributing to that. Well, over the years, we've done quite a few experiments looking at water chemistry, one of which focused specifically on the impact sulfate to chloride ratio has on hazy IPA. Results from that when we're back from this break. Have you ever thought about adding a port to your kettle but held off because you didn't feel like drilling into your gear or sending it off to have someone else do it? From the makers of the world's fastest counterflow chiller, the Exchillerator, comes the Hangover. The easiest way to add extra ports to your kettle as well as countless other options. Mount a faucet to your keg for easy portable pouring. Set up the perfect whirlpool arm. Hold a heating element in place. All of this and so much more without permanently modifying your gear. Manufactured right here in the United States, The Hangover offers brewers too many convenient solutions to list here. So head over to Accelerator.com today to see what The Hangover can do for you. As every brewer knows, the best beer requires the best hops, which Yakima Valley Hops provides fresh from the source to brewers around the world, carrying everything from classics like Cascade to modern favorites like Galaxy and Mosaic, as well as other ingredients and gear, Yakima Valley Hops has it all. And don't forget to check out their new podcast, The Late Edition, where the YVH crew goes into depth on our favorite plant with industry experts. Head over to YakimaValleyHops.com now to see all they have to offer and subscribe to The Late Edition wherever it is you listen to podcasts. Craftmaster Growlers takes traveling with and sharing beer to a new level. Made from heavy-duty stainless steel, Craftmaster Growlers are double wall insulated and can keep beer cold for up to eight hours. Unlike typical growlers, Craftmaster Growlers come with a swiveling tap and fully integrated CO2 regulator cap, allowing beer to stay fresh for two weeks or more. The square design takes up less space and will fit in most refrigerator doors, and every Craftmaster Growler comes with a one-year warranty. There are 64 and 128-ounce versions available over at CraftmasterGrowlers.com. The brew in a bag method is blown up over the last few years, and in that time, it's become very clear that not all bags are created equal. For the best BIAB experience, you have got to go with the brew bag. Made from high-quality, food-safe polyester, the brew bag is available in both 210 micron for standard brew in a bag, as well as 400 micron, which works beautifully for all-in-one recirculating systems. I've been a brew bag user for years and wouldn't brew without it. Head over to brewinabag.com to get the fabric filter that works for you and use promo code TBP17 at checkout out to receive a discount. Again, that's brewinabag.com. I know some people think it's absolute hogwash, and that's okay with me, but most of the folks I know who regularly brew excellent examples of hazy IPA rely on water profiles that favor chloride to sulfate, as we discussed earlier, which is opposite that uh, of what you might find in a normal, clear American IPA. Curious to see for ourselves, Andy, you put it to the test. Yeah, so uh, I'm I'm an old hand at this point at brewing hazy IPAs. (laughs) Uh, My friends wanted them, and I started brewing them. Uh, So, you know, I I like the style. Um, I think... Of any beer I've had more in the last five years, it's probably been a hazy IPA from all examples from all breweries. I will say, I, I think the hit rate on hazy IPA, I, I think there's more misses than hits. Amen. Uh, I, <laughs> I, I think, uh, but you know, when it's like when it's done right, I, I think it's really tasty. I think uh, the guys I like the most brewing them have dialed in their process. They're much more consistent. Uh, but you know, I usually, if I'm at a brewery, I'll try their hazy IPA and if mm-hmm. it's good, I'll get another one. I'll probably switch to something they're probably better at. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm with you on that one. In fact, I, I, I usually, when I go to breweries nowadays, I, I, I like to try everything they have on tap. So I'm the weirdo sure. who orders a, a flight and I know that some people poo poo that, but I love getting flights and then I'll pick from oh, there yeah, what I, I want to get a pint of. Um, I mean, it's obviously it's been almost a year now that we've been able to do yeah. that, but yeah, I haven't, been, haven't, yeah. haven't been able to get a taster rack in a while. I can't <laughs> wait for that day to come back. <laughs> exactly. It's Soon enough, man. Hopefully it's here sooner than later. But you were interested uh, to explore this idea of sulfate to chloride ratio yeah. in New England IPA. And you did uh, you brewed two batches side by side to test it out. Yeah. yeah. So what we're doing is going to start with a clean and correct, a juicy, hazy New England IPA. So we started I always start all my brewing with RO water. So we looked at having one batch have 124 ppm of, of sulfate to 42 ppm of chloride, while the other one was 41 to 123. Those numbers, I try to get them as close as possible uh, using the minerals in brewing water, and I was able to dial those in. And I do have this, the sheet here, my checklist for the day. So the uh, 124 uh, to 
42 batch. I started the with just gypsum and calcium. I just ignored Epsom salt completely. So gypsum and calcium chloride. Uh, the gypsum numbers were 4.2 grams in the mash to 2.94 grams in the boil. And the calcium chloride was 1.25 grams in the mash to 80, 0.88 grams in the boil. And then for the other side, the 40, uh, 41 to 123, the gypsum was 1.4 grams in the mash and 0.98 in the boil versus the calcium chloride was 3.65 grams in the mash to 2.56 grams in the boil yeah. so you can see that you know huge amounts of grams difference there yeah well that and also the you know people who are unfamiliar with adjusting water chemistry uh for a five gallon batch of, of beer you you're not adding that much of these compounds and you're getting quite the hit uh, in your ppm yes. it's really interesting and just for those who are curious who don't feel like doing the math uh andy you were aiming for ratios of about three to one and one to three yep. uh just just to be clear on that and we tried to get those as close as possible which is it's pretty easy to do if you have if you have a nice uh you know uh, a scale yeah exactly yeah go to go on amazon Th there's tons of different scales they da go down to about a tenth to a hundredth of a gram and if they work really well they're battery operated you fire them up the one thing i will say <laughs> and i've i've been using the same scale for many years is uh these these minerals will corrode out the uh, the, the panels so maybe get um, I, I like to put them on like a piece of aluminum foil so yeah. not ruining the panel or you can get these little dishes that will not really affect the scale very much they're very lightweight and then you can just pour those into your uh, into your kettle or mash tun so they're really convenient and I just say have them you know I get a bigger scale for hops of course you can use the small scale for hops too if it's you want to be really precise uh, but they're super easy and you never have to think about it ever again yeah if you if you go to Amazon uh, and if you could use the brewlosophy link we'd really appreciate it you go to Amazon and you look for blade scale they're like 11 bucks yeah. I've I've had the same. I've got two of them. The one that I use for hop additions that goes to the tenth, uh, I believe it's a tenth, and the other one goes to the to the hundredth, and that's what I use for my water mineral additions. Super easy to use. Super easy to add this stuff. It's not as scary as a lot of people think. So it probably took you about three minutes to yep. get to get your uh, water your your minerals all set for both of these batches. Uh, tell us a little bit about the grist for these, because uh, because we know that New England IPA has a slightly different uh, grist than normal IPA. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I at home, I have a sack of, uh, usually have a sack of Pilsner and a sack of pale malt around. And then I, I'm looking at the recipe, I'm, I'm thinking I was running a little low on both. So I combined the two. So 43% Pilsner malt, 36% pale malt. Key here, 21% flaked oats. Yeah. Uh, the, you know, very common to add that haze. The oats is also supposedly providing a softer mouthfeel yeah. uh, downstream we're going to talk about the dry hopping and it, that is really where the that permanent haze is coming from yeah. uh, but it is have the oats so after that we you know did the mash so we do a mash at 149 fahrenheit or 65 degrees celsius that was for 60 minutes when the mashes were complete the we started boiling the wort in my house we do uh, batch sparging so i did the the, fir the first batch dr drain that off and then did a batch sparge uh, once both of those were fully drained and mixed you know, we did the mineral additions in the mash. I had the mineral additions for the other, uh, for the boil at the beginning. I boiled the wort for 60 minutes. We did uh, combinations of cashmere, amarillo, and Idaho 7. So six grams of cashmere at 45 minutes. That just establishes a very base bitterness. Yeah. I just want a little in the beginning. And then at uh, at 10 minutes left, we added 43 grams of ca of amarillo, 43 grams of Idaho 7, and 28 grams of, of galaxy. And then I like to do a whirlpool addition. For those that aren't familiar with whirlpool, you cool the wort a little bit. You can do this by adding your immersion chiller or you can recirc a little bit in your in your coils to get it to like maybe 180 Fahrenheit. This is to stop uh, stop as much as possible isomerization of alpha acids mm -hmm. to add bitterness. All you want is flavor. So that Whirlpool edition was held for 15 minutes and that was a addition of, of, of Amarillo and Idaho 7, 43 grams of each. And I held it for about 10 minutes. Then cool the rest of the way all the way down into my fermenters. Uh, both beers because uh, we're not editing the grain bill we're only editing the water edition we got a uh, 1.067 og and that was to assume i was not going to finish out too dry because that's kind of the style they the there is a some residual sweetness to the beer yeah I, I actually thought this was interesting because one of the things a lot of people will talk about uh with water chemistry adjustments in general is that it can increase uh conversion or have some sort of an impact on on conversion in this case the the different sulfate to chloride ratios didn't seem to have any, I mean, clearly they were both 1067 OG, didn't seem mm -hmm. to have any impact on conversion of starches into, into fermentable sugars. Uh, they're both starting at the same spot. Yeah, exactly. So uh, after that, we put them into PET carboys and I put them in my fermentation chamber uh, and set the chamber to 66 Fahrenheit or 19 degrees Celsius. After they reached that pitching temperature, I added a pouch of each to each of Imperial Yeast A38 juice. This is the 
prototypical hazy IPA yeast. Yeah, yeah. It's the Boddington strain, I believe, is, is where the original source was. So uh, once fermentation kicked off, about two days into fermentation uh, with high Krausen, I added my dry hop to the beer. This was a combination of Amarillo and Galaxy. And at that point, you do it at that point, this is the common belief or common, you know, wisdom on hazy IPAs is that there's some type of biotransformation happening. So you're adding it at that peak Krausen. This will also, in my opinion, and I think this is pretty much the accepted opinion of why the haze is coming from. When you add that dry hop so early in the fermentation, that's when you're getting this polyphenol yeast kind of all getting all together. And that's when this permanent haze is going to develop. And that's what keeps that haze throughout the rest of the beer. Yeah. The, the whole biotransformation thing I think is fascinating. I think we've done one experiment on it. Um, biotransformation is a real thing. Uh, we, we know that it occurs in certain conditions and environments. There's a lot of, uh, uh, I guess, controversy, as controversial as things in brewing can get, uh, about whether it's actually happening in most New England IPA when you're by adding hops uh, you know, during high croissant. To me, the biggest benefit of adding hops at high croissant is that you've still got active yeast to scrub any oxygen that's introduced at that yes, point. Yes, yes, and so yes. that is a, I feel like a lot of people nowadays are using that technique in part for that reason, but then also they'll come back later and add another dry hop because of course you can't add enough hops to, to these New England IPAs. Well, well, I can't sell a beer, Marshall, unless it's double dry hop. That's so right, I have that's to dry right. hop it again. <laughs> so yeah, it's so fascinating actually, because I think the biotransformation stuff really got people talking about what's going on in the fermenter when you're dry hopping. This led to the discovery of hop creep, yeah. which is the fact that when you add hops to be, to a finished beer or fermenting beer, the, the finishing gravity was dropping after you added the hops. And that's because the hops themselves have enzymes on them, just like the malt does. And I was tracing this back. You know, you, can you guess the year the first paper or, or, or a paper was published that stated this? Uh, no. 1905. 1905, was, really? Because I, I know yeah, that yeah. She, Dr. Shellhammer has talked a bit about it recently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I went back and I followed the, uh, the citations. They knew about this, you know, 100, 100 years ago. And then we had to rediscover it. It's amazing. Crazy. So, yeah. So, uh, you know, I let the beer finish out. Um, and so after another six days of activity was uh, all done, I racked the beers because I don't want the hops to sit on the beer or the beer sit on the hops too long. Right. I think there's some ne ne negative uh, components of the dry hopping. And so I racked them into purged uh, cornies. Uh, they both had the f same finishing gravity of 1.010. Again, uh, you know, we're not seeing any differences here that we could say were caused by the different sulfate to chloride ratios in these beers, which had, you know, markedly different water profiles, mm -hmm. uh, but but it didn't have any impact. Now we can say on enzymatic conversion of those starches, but also nope. on attenuation. Um, I, I think that's interesting information. I mean, I don't think there are many people out there arguing necessarily that sulfate and chloride are a huge contributor to these things. But I do think that it's it, it's at least interesting enough to point out that it didn't have any impact on those. Uh, aspects of, of this process so far. So after I racked them, we set them up to, to carbonate. And then a few weeks later, I served them to myself in our COVID blind uh, technique. Uh. <laughs> I did 10, I did 10 trials where we take four cups uh, that look identical. I pour two of each and then mix them up and then grab three cups. And that, that way I am semi blind. I did 10 trials, uh, given our the, the peculiarities of COVID doing it myself. And we try to pick a way of picking a number of how many should I have to pick to tell them apart. I would have to get seven, seven out of 10 times. I have to pair them correctly. I actually got them only four times. I could not tell these beers apart. This is this. I remember when you were telling us prior to putting this, uh, you know, publishing this experiment article, and I cannot wait again to get back to our normal data collection methods. I think all of us are excited to get there. But the fact that you biased as hell, knowing yeah. exactly everything you did to these beers, knowing what to expect because you are a knowledgeable brewer. The fact mm -hmm. you couldn't reliably distinguish a high sulfate to chloride ratio version of this New England IPA from a low uh, ratio version really was surprising to me because we've gotten so many results, blind taster results, showing that water chemistry really does have an impact. Now, in thinking about why maybe you weren't able to do that, did you, I mean, I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are on how these beers tasted or what you recall of them, um, but did you like have any ideas as to why maybe or how we could explain the fact that you were unable to tell them apart or yeah i, I have a couple theories and i think this goes to the you know the how we do our data collection is, is critical and for me you know i'm one guy when we do him in the big group we get a lot more pr 
flavor profiles. Yeah. Everyone's ability to taste is unique to them. And that is critical for these things. You know, if everyone could taste it the same way, it would the data collection would be meaningless because we don't get any statistics. We need <laughs> we need these numbers. It's true. So yeah. for me, for me, you know, I didn't get it. That doesn't mean that when we do it for twenty people, someone will pick it up. I, I think so. So f- it, it, I think it's maybe maybe me. But there's also the case to be said that with these beers, there's so much going on with them, and so many other things, and especially for 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 my palate for hazy IPA, the hop load is so big it really blows out everything else in the beer and i think that may have a con- contribution yeah so again i'm gonna i'm gonna point it out again the easiest scapegoat in this whole thing is you is the taster Absolutely. oh you're a terrible palate you're just not good at yeah. tasting it's really tough one for me to accept because you brew beer. I don't know many yeah. brewers who have crappy enough palates to keep brewing beer. I mean, that doesn't make sense. Exactly. If you want to believe that it's just because Andy's palate sucks, by all means, yeah. do that. I think you're wrong. So to yeah. me, if I'm if I'm going to arrogantly accept <laughs> that it's not you, Andy, that's the yeah. issue, that it's the beers just really weren't as perceptibly different as we might have expected, my mind automatically goes to, well, was the delta in those ratios really that, yeah. that different? Were those ratios as as extreme as they could have been. And when you look back back at past water chemistry experiments, usually we're testing an extreme. And I felt like in this one, three to one and one to three wasn't an extreme, which made it even more interesting to me because now we're looking and saying, well, what happens? You know, how, how... small does that difference have to be for you to still be able to taste it? And it seemed that in this case, at least with you, that yeah. that, that smaller difference of three to one or one to three just didn't seem to have much of an impact. And like you said, all of that hopping character, that hop character uh, uh, j- would could make sense to me that it might overwhelm any differences caused by the water profile uh, in this particular experiment. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think for me, it was very enlightening, of course. I think all the ones I've done so far, even though they're just myself, and maybe I, my girlfriend gets in the mix and and she she tries to tell them apart too, but you know it's it's you know not seeing the result is, is so enlightening to be like what is really going on when we change these things. So I, if I go back to this, and I think I would love to come back and revisit this thing, is I would ch- it would do one of the two these two. I would either uh, increase the the delta, go like five to one, be the real extreme, and yeah. see what happens. Yeah, or increase the amounts so that we're staying at the same ratio, but we're doubling the total amounts we're putting in yeah and then see if there's an impact so there is i don't have it in front of me now uh but i believe jake did an experiment on an, another one the, the 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 i think the one that inspired this one a yeah. sulfate to chloride ratio experiment where he did uh, a more of an extreme thing like that and I, I believe they were indistinguishable among a panel of tasters that when the ratio stayed the same but the amounts were diff were vastly different people couldn't mm-hmm. tell a difference and i i Again, don't don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure that's the case. That's fascinating to me as well because it does yeah. it supports that idea that the ratio is what matters more than necessarily yeah. the amount. So, well, this was a fascinating experiment to me. I do trust your palate, Andy, and so I thought I thought the results were very very interesting, and so did a lot of our readers who left some comments. We're going to go through some of those now. The first one comes from somebody who calls themselves RO, <laughs> and they say. Do you add SMB at kegging? I know some at Brulosophy do, and this would increase the SO or SO4, the sulfate level, uh, which would screw your water profile. Yeah, I do not. Um, I know Jake does, and he's actually really into it, and it's super curious to me. Mm -hmm. I think he's published like five or six articles on that, and it's super cool because... You know, in beer making, unlike other styles of stuff, there's very little additives. Yeah, I think the one we see a lot of it in is wine making, mm-hmm. and it makes sense. Wine is made once a year, and it's make it or break it, man. It's got to survive. So they add a lot of stabilizers to make sure nothing crazy happens, and so it makes perfect sense for these styles where we're really trying to minimize oxidative pickup. Makes sense to me. I've not explored it yet. Um, I definitely want to get into that and, and see what happens, but um, I don't do it. So I'm gonna I'm gonna try to be uh, a little bit smart here because I, I I don't know if I have this exactly down. I'm not a chemist, but. SMB is sodium metabisulfite. Uh, people use that, again, to stabilize wines, stabilize cider. I believe some people are even... And by stabilize, we're talking about to stop the yeast from fermenting so that you can mm-hmm. add other things to it. It's a smart move if for adding, if you want to back sweeten with fruit and not have the yeast ferment it, it works. 
So when you add SMB, it, it, what happens is as it, I believe, uh, does its work when it whether interacts with oxygen or whatever it is, it breaks down into the various uh, other components. And one of the one of the results is sulfide, which is a uh, um, farty smelling, <laughs> you know, yeah. it smells like rotten eggs. Um, and yep. and I, I don't know if it increases sulfate levels or not. I, I, I trust RO on this, um, but that is an interesting thing to talk about because if it increases your sulfate levels by adding it as a way to um, reduce the potential for cold side oxidation, are you impacting that perceived hop brightness as well? I mean, it, it makes sense to me that it might do that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It, it's, you know, you're going doing kind of two things at once if it is at contributing to the sulfite, sulfate level at all, uh, because then you're also removing oxygen. So it's it would be very hard to tease that out yeah um unless you had a way of really controlling the oxidation like adding micro amounts of oxidation to then you know goose the beer one way or the other yeah. so it's super yeah. interesting actually yeah yeah great comment um I, that's something i want to talk with jake a bit about because i do you know the guys who are using smb uh in the, for their packaging purposes i think phil does it as well um in fact i know he does because he just emailed me about a beer he's got on tap that's a little bit eggy and mm -hmm. that's part of the reason i'm not i don't do it i prefer reducing cold side oxidation in my process as opposed to using chemicals so i you know rack yeah. into purged kegs and i don't let oxygen yeah. touch the beer all that kind of stuff so there's one uh, one weird trick with uh camden tablets and things like that you can use it to remove chloramine from your water yeah. if you live in a chloramine district so think about that yep and and it works fantastically for that again very small amounts are very effective for that Next mm -hmm. comment comes from Lee Bjornstrand. He says, I think the mineral quantities could have been increased to maybe gain a more pro a pronounced distinction between the two beers. You mentioned ratios of three to one up to seven to one are normal. And yet the lower end of this range is what you tested here. Yeah. So I wanted to pick one where we know there's a clear difference because we calculated these weights. These weights are different mm -hmm. and it's not the extreme. You know, there's I could I could give you a tongue in cheek answer and give you a serious answer. I, I think the serious one is, you know, we want to explore all parts of these very Bulls. Yeah. I think the tongue in cheek one is Andy does have to drink these beers at the end of the day. <laughs> and I was getting a little bit gun shy about t shoving in, you know, 15 grams of gypsum into five gallons of beer. So sorry, though. I am like I said, I completely agree with the sentiment and I completely agree with what he said, what they're saying. I will explore this in the future with higher loads and different ratios just to see what happens and keep the beer identical. Yeah. And, and in fact, I, you know, we've been focusing a lot in the past couple of years on hazy IPA with this stuff, but I'd be fascinated to see, you know, uh, a, a, a similar comparison, maybe again, higher ratios. Or, or, or more the delta between the ratios being larger in a West Coast IPA. Does it impact that, that clarity? Does it does it ha cause is this a main source of the uniqueness of hazy IPA? I think would be really interesting. Mm -hmm. Next comment comes from Michael Boson, who says, I think a different style would be a better test. Oh, well, here you go. New England IPA is noted for its absence of both maltiness and bitterness. I don't think that's true. I think New England IPA has a unique maltiness that that it's yeah. kind of known for. Um, but but I get that it's not like, you know, malt forward it's not it's not um, munich malt forward or anything like that but it's not um delicate in any way much like west coast ipa is a delicate uh beer i, I think that it's you know we're you know we're picking styles and, and seeing what happens and, and i think of anything in the recent memory water chemistry and hazy ipas go hand in hand i i, I have to see that because it's such a different mouth flavor mouth feel and flavor profile than other beers i mean i, I would love to look at other styles i mean this originally started with a Pilsner style. Yeah. Um, we can go into English mild. We can go into West Coast IPA. Uh, I think, you know, for me and, and seeing that it didn't matter or at least did not, the data did not come back significant for my palate. Yeah. I want to come back to Hazy IPA on this one. Uh, but absolutely, let's look at, I think it, you make a great point, Marshall. Let's look at West Coast and then really drive it in. It's like, okay, we made it super chloride forward. What happened? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I think it'd be really interesting to see if I if I confirm my bias that it, it creates yes. that warming <laughs> sensation in <laughs> yes, my mouth. Yes, so. yes. Yes. Final comment comes from Eric Branshad. He says, uh, this doesn't surprise me at all, given the overall amounts used are so low. I really feel that this uh, sulfate to chloride ratio is an outdated statistic and that the overall concentration of each ion is much more valuable. If you were in the 200 ppm range of sulfate and chloride, then I think you'd be more likely to notice a difference. Again, this is one of those things that is, is again, in, you know, in brewing is relatively contentious because there are folks out there who say that it really is just the 
the ratio that matters. What it sounds like Eric is saying to me is you could have kept the ratio at three to one, but if you were at 200 ppm sulfate to what's that 75 or so ppm of chloride and then reversed those that he thinks you would have tasted the difference. I'm not sure that's the case, but possibly. Yeah, possibly. And I think, you know, we on Brewlosophy test a lot of things where we're trying stuff, but we only have so many uh, times to try things, you know, so many uh, cracks to do this. And, you know, a lot of the data we get is is from the collective use of information and and, and brew pubs and, and big brewing and stuff like that. So it didn't work for me in this one trial experiment we're obviously going to revisit these things in bigger uh, bigger numbers of tasters and in different styles of beer. And yeah, I would love to try upping the numbers and see what happens. And I am kind of in your camp, Marshall. I don't think I'm going to taste a difference, but let's see. Yeah. Yeah. And the fact that we own our bias in that and, you know, I, I think it's helpful. And that's why we serve these beers in non-COVID days to other tasters. And I promise you, we will get back to doing that. I've been hearing a lot of crap from people about, oh, <laughs> these don't matter anymore because it's just one person. Yeah, I get it, man. But we're doing the best we can to keep you guys entertained <laughs> during COVID. So hopefully it's helping. Well, that does bring us to the end of this episode. Is there anything else on sulfate to chloride ratios in New England IPA that you got for us, Andy? I think, you know, we get a lot of brewers just starting and trying out stuff. And it, it seems like kind of like deer in the headlights. There's so many things to worry about. <laughs> yeah. I think water is the one thing where, like we said at the front of the show, if it tastes good, brew with it. You know, first of all, Get rid of any of the chlorine, get rid of any of the, the chloramine in your water because that will cause tons of problems. The best way to start was RO water. And you know what? Just brew with the RO water. You're going to brew great beer. And then when you want to evolve, when you want to be like, okay, how do I really dial this and how do I really tweak it? Then start looking at the minerals because you can make great beer with just RO water and then start layering this on. And this is just another tool in your toolkit to finish your beer the way you want to taste it. Yeah, I agree. And honestly, sulfate to chloride ratios is a is a easy, easy place to start. They are just ratios. Download Brew and Water Spreadsheet. Give it a shot. I think you'll be glad that you did. All right, don't forget to subscribe to our newest podcast, The Brew Lab, where host Kate Job takes you into the lab with beer scientists to discuss research they've completed. And as always, you can read more about the experiment we discussed by clicking the link to the article on brewlosophy.com in the description of this episode. The Brewlosophy podcast is made possible by the generous support of our sponsors as well as all of our rad listeners. We seriously could not do this without you. Cheers to everyone who has subscribed and left a review of our show. It makes a huge difference. If you haven't yet, please consider doing so. Head over to brewlosophy.com slash support to view a list of ways you can easily help us to continue producing this podcast. If you want a reward for your support, visit patreon.com slash brewlosophy. Thanks again for listening. We'll be back next week with another episode of the Brewlosophy podcast. Until then, think beer. Start off the morning with some hot tea, lemon and honey, cause it soothes my bro. Put some herb in the bowl, yeah, it's homegrown. Ain't gotta go through.